Oh yeah, that's that's super super nice. That's super nice. The first time, hmm. Let's start off with this. This would be so awesome, though. The first time you got to Nepal, let's 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 go ahead and track back the moments of your journey here. Oh, 1990. So I came here in December of 1990, um, or maybe late November. Yeah. Uh, to uh, an Amadalam expedition, and you know I was a young youngster at the time, and <laughs> we drove to Jiri and then walked from Jiri and and then had the expedition and. It was back when it was, and there weren't that many expeditions on it. And it was at yeah. the very end of November, early, early December. So a fall ascent, but not yeah. a, a calendar Christmas time or after the twenty-first. How was it back then in the nineties? So when you when you when you look back now, we're in twenty-three, right? But when you when you look back in the nineties, how equipped were we for expeditions back in the day? Things were. It was still like you were going camping. Mm. And I remember we had to go into a, a bazaar and buy all the aluminum pans and the, the cook stuff. We bought the stove and the kerosene stove. We had bought that all new. And then we just had small tents. It wasn't the level of comfort that is now sort of people are used to it in the, in the expedition base camps. Now when you look at it, right, now when you look at it, like I, I do see pictures of a lot of expeditions, not just in Nepal, but around yeah. the world. Now it's completely different. Yeah. They're the glamping thing, so. But you go to the mountains to have fun, not to <laughs> sit in a hotel. And my idea of fun is getting cold and hungry, so <laughs> maybe not for everyone. <laughs> Very true. How was Alaska back in the day? Like The first trips up there, um, 87, and went up to... Uh, the Kachatna Spires, and that was drove a Ford van up from Utah, and <laughs> it broke down. And yeah, they were. It's interesting. We do all these adventures, but we yeah. didn't have the internet. We didn't have mobile technology. But I mean, I was like, how did we do that? How did we know to like meet on a Saturday morning, or you'd leave a voice message, or you'd be like, okay, we're gonna go climbing, yeah. and you'd set that time, and you'd have to meet with it. And now we're just if you open up your phone and there's 30 different apps all screaming for attention. Yeah. But only a small bit of attention. It's not like reading a book. You have to, it's a little scatterbrained. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The thing is, I was, uh, the thing is, I'm a big believer in working when you're young. Mm -hmm. If I'm not mistaken, you started working in a mountaineering shop or something very equivalent to that at a very young age. How old were you at that time? Well, I work, starting in the, in the gear shop was, um, I was 21, so, but I had worked in the woods and like on the farm, yeah. that kind of stuff you do with your family. Yeah, yeah. And, and selling firewood, that was my... <laughs> that was your thing? Yeah, the, cut wood, put it in the back of a truck, drive it and drop it off. <laughs> The entry to the en well, let me put it this way: the entry to adventure started at a very young age. A lot of friends who are probably listening right now, not just in Nepal but around the world, you know, you you get inspired at a very young age, probably looking at uh, your parents, probably looking at your surrounding, probably looking at what you have in your vicinity, right? At when you were young, I'm just trying to track back on that. W what was your thought process towards what you're going to do for the remainder of your life? We went into the mountains at a young age with parents, and so that was what we did on summer vacation and went with a, a mule and mm. a family, four kids and two parents, and we'd go camping and fishing in the mountains of uh, the Sierra Nevada of California, and that was what we did. So that was um, – but at age 14, I, I kind of had this moment coming out of the mountains – that this is what I want to do. So it was like, everything I'm going to do, I'm going to have to save money so I can spend time outdoors. I was just, I found my happy place. And then once climbing at that point, that mm. having to put yourself in a precarious relationship with gravity, that then changes how we communicate. And that I kind of connected on that on a very fundamental manner. That was just like, this is me. This is it. This is what I'm going to go do. For the rest of your life. 
Yeah, I didn't think I was going to make any money at it. <laughs> <laughs> My grandmother was like, don't go do something. But I, it's it, it'd be fortunate to have it introduced by by parents that wanted to go do those things. Yeah. Now, now I'm just coming back to the current times and probably talking about the future. That I love talking about the future. Now, h how do you think friends around the world see mountaineering? If you're a climber and you're... It's what you do. You you see all the nuances and the different ways that we go climbing and all the different peaks and everything like that. But if you're a, a lay person and you are reliant on the general media communication, you might think that all the climbing is Everest in the spring with a big crowd on there. And, and so there's there's so much ability and within the climbing community and options of places to go climbing. Yeah, yeah. How did you go out and see Nepal? How did you see Nepal in the 90s and how do you see it now? In the 90s, I came here and I was like, oh, I'm going to go climbing and same thing with the first trip to India and J&K and that you're there. Oh, you're going to do it because it's about yourself. Like yeah. I come back and I'm a hero and I climb this and <laughs> I did it and it was hard and I suffered and all that. But then what I realized that it was the the beauty of Nepal is is the people and the people are There's a great understanding and happiness, and there are good people to be around. So that was always – that's <laughs> – life is short, so surround yourself with good people. And Nepal is a country full of good people. <laughs> oh, oh, thank you so much for that. Thank you so much for that. And life – life is short. Yeah. <laughs> We're born, and we struggle with gravity, and some of us that – base jumpers and parachutes and – We play with gravity on a very severe way with consequence, and then eventually we get old and gravity wins and we're dead. <laughs> so That's how, it, how you'd like to go ahead and put it, right? Yeah, gravity rules everything. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's such a fantastic way to go ahead and say it. I was, I was trying to read up on this place called the deepest part in the ocean called the Challenger Deep. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously... Also go ahead and try to. I, I I love the depth as well as the height, and definitely yeah. go ahead and look at look up in the sky and probably try to imagine that. Well, not imagine. There are definitely up there. The astronauts are up mm -hmm. there, and uh, every time I see a mountain, I always try to go ahead and imagine that probably there's somebody up there, or at least trying to go ahead and get yeah. up there. At the end of the day, I've I've heard you say this. I've heard you say so many different things, right? But just trying to understand it. You're fighting with yourself every time you climb, fighting with your mind. How how would you like to go ahead and put it? Is there a fight somewhere? It's not a fight. It's a challenge. So a fight is aggression and things like that. So, But you're, I, okay, I'm going to go climbing and gravity is constant. So, mm. But once I get three body lengths above the ground, your brain starts working in a different way because self-preservation takes it hold yeah. so if you get scared or something like that or you see a wolf or a bear you that very primal instinct that's at the back of our head is like i've got to survive and so when you get up in elevation you're using that ancient mm. brain stem that controls the autonomic part of our existence the the eating and, and the sleeping and the breathing and you know, the basic human drives but then we build into it the The cerebral, the, the prefrontal cortex, which is giving us microphones and yeah. computers and yeah. TikTok and everything else in the world. So <laughs> yeah. you get to integrate both those in there. So where chess is very cerebral, it's all here in this front part, mm. but you're not going to have that visceral, like, I might could die. And for some people, that's... Um, It's a sought-after thing, so I'm sure <laughs> the medical community would give us all sorts of excuses. But as long as I'm not harming other people and I'm having fun doing it, why not? Oh. Oh. <laughs> fun. You know, the word fun is such, a, such an interesting uh, word now, especially for, for a lot of friends who want to go ahead and uh, scale mountains. Let me just go ahead and stick yep. with mountains for now. How 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 would you like to go ahead and define scaling a peak? There's imagine it as a big circle. Yeah. So we have 
the ideation. So you might be at lunch. You're like, oh, let's go climb in the Gorkha region. Yeah. So you plan a trip to Nepal. And then, oh, maybe Manaslu might be the peak you want to climb. And then you get the, the permit. You do the planning. Everything comes into place. So you can then do that. So and then you do the – you actually go do the climb. And then you experience it. And you come back. And you reconnect. And and when you get home, that's the, the full circle of that experience. And so it's not arriving at the summit or getting back to base camp. But it's making – a complete journey out of and yeah. each one of those aspects has a it's part of our happiness so if we're planning a trip and and you like that kind of challenge and planning then you're you're having fun and everyone whatever we do in life as long as you're passionate about what you do and it doesn't harm other humans it, it's the beauty of humanity yeah. and i'm not a sculptor or an artist i'm not a a, a, a when your area of expertise, so, but we all, if we all did the same thing, it wouldn't be, life would be boring. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it definitely would be yeah. boring. It definitely would be boring. And that's something that, not just me, a lot of friends question, question what they're doing. I'm sure somebody who's listening right now must be questioning, am I doing the right thing in my life? Do I need to go out and do something else? Scale it. Everybody has mountains. Everybody has their own mountains that yeah. need to go ahead and climb, right? Somebody must be questioning that right now at this moment. Whether that going climbing is the right thing? Going, uh, whatever that mountain yeah. is, you know, maybe maybe somebody wants to excel in business, right? But they're doing something completely different. Maybe somebody wants to go ahead and be an innovator, but probably doing something yeah. different, right? What would you like to go ahead and say to somebody who wants to do it but hasn't had that push yet or is looking for that push? The push is going to come from inside. Mm -hmm. Your motivation is going to get you to the summit of the peak or it's going to get you to open that business or to write code that's going to change the world. It has to come from within. And that's your internal motivation that you're, that goes with you. And then there's – it. a lot of it depends on one station in life. Yeah, I'm a white guy from the richest country in America, and I've got the world handed to me. I mean, I realize that privilege, and it's not the same for everyone in the world. And so being able to say, oh, I'm going to dedicate my life to climbing and making a business out of being out there, and that's something that by birth I was able to do. And there's probably millions of people in Nepal that are like, yeah, I'd love to go climb a mountain. I'd love to go do this, but they're they're – what they need to get going in life yeah. is, 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 is more pressing. And so recognizing that is, is a start. But within whatever one's means are in life, if, there's, if you have a goal and a dream, then there's, there's really no one stopping you. It's just you've you got to say, this is what I want to do. <laughs> this is what I want to do and this is what I want to kind of go for, right? That's uh, pushing it. Pushing it so far, right? Pushing it so far. I remember there's an instance where I heard that you'd said that uh, when you when you climbed Everest without uh, oxygen at one point, it was like, well, probably I pushed it too far. Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> was it the third, third, third? Uh, it's third time. Third time, right? Yeah. Why did, so, why, why did you decide to go out and go without oxygen at that time? That, well, to fair means. and <laughs> <laughs> I, Yeah, it was because I'd used it previously. I'd climbed it twice from the north in Tibet, and yeah. then that third time was from Nepal. And, uh, yeah, it, it felt good doing it, but I know that my O2 saturation on the summit was 52%, and I trashed my um, my – my kidneys and, and oh. my urine, I mean, everything that was, it's just really hard on the body. And yeah. then I think that was the precursor to then five years later having a heart attack on um, on the side of the mountain, or four years later, 2016. Yeah. So. 6,000 meters along that line? Yeah. That's, uh, Climbing that, trip that, with David Lama. Uh, yeah. yeah, that was, yeah. That was uh, yeah, around 6,000 meters, if I'm not mistaken, right? 20,000 yeah. feet? Yeah, maybe a few hundred meters below, but it was... Yeah, on a 7,000-meter peak, so we were still at 1,000 meters of climbing. Jesus. And then I hitchhiked a ride on a helicopter. Jesus. <laughs> and we all, we all saw tidbits of it on, um, on the Internet, of, on the video. And yeah. 
Man. Yeah, there's a Red Bull film out there. And then David went back and climbed the, the mountain. I know. And then a tragedy, and that was in October of 2018. And then 2019, April of 2019, he perished in an avalanche. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Hans Jorg and Jess. So, yeah. Mountains play for keeps. I mean, it's a high price to pay to remind us to be present and live in the moment. Yeah. But once you see that, then you're, you're not going to fritter away it's like now is this is it this is living <laughs> you want it more do you want more of it of life mm, when it's the toughest you know when you when when it's when it's very tough when you know that your body is given up and you still have to go out and take that one more step and then once you take that step you take the other step Like, what gets, what gets you going? Yeah, <clears throat> but for climbing mountains, it's, it's basically, it's very ego-driven. You want to prove it to yourself, and you want to prove it to your friends in, in, in a different way. That, in that. But, it's, but not everyone, their idea of fun is to go get cold on a Himalayan peak that's yeah. steep with rock fall and run out of food and a lack of oxygen. It's kind of suffering. But <laughs> I'm weird. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. You're a legend. I'm, I'm glad <laughs> that I got the opportunity to sit with you. I'm just trying to go out and I remember, I remember every time, I remember one of my friends, he had climbed Everest and then he was here the next day. So I got very lucky that I got to get a hold of him. This was right, right during COVID. And... Uh, There's a very simple thing that I asked him, like, what goes in your mind when you're, when you're trying to, when you're, try, when you're summiting from the final uh, camp four, if I'm not mistaken? Yep. The final summit, the final push. What goes in your mind? And his simple answer was, like, I'm sure something's running in your mind. And his simple answer was, Sanjay, I was just thinking about where to put my next foot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Has there ever been a moment when... You were like, okay, I'm just going to go ahead and like completely give up. No, I haven't had that, like, oh, I'm, I've always had that, I'm, I'm going to fight for my life. And I've had close calls with avalanches, and the heart attack was a, a very protracted conversation with the recycler, so to say, for nine hours. Yeah. The recycler is our man, gravity. Yeah. Because then once we're dead, the <laughs> we become plant food again <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but the um yeah i tend to think about friends and people i'm with or the scenery um but yeah when you're on everest you're not thinking about all too much because there's a lack of oxygen yeah. and the body takes care of itself so it pulls oxygen and blood away from your hands and feet you get colder feet and then you need a lot of sugar to run this central processing unit we have between our shoulders. <laughs> and, and so when you're not eating because of lack of oxygen, it just sort of all stacks up against you. Never a moment ever in your life that you're like, okay, I'm just going to give up. No, I'm going to fight for life. <laughs> I'm going to hold on to it. And I wake up in the morning, I'm like, where's life taking me? And you see that with our communication just to get here. And I'm like, okay, we're going to, you know, yesterday got over busy and then today was visa emergencies and so I like wake up and I just grab the horns of life and let's go and <laughs> so that's how it's been since the beginning of time yeah my factory setting was yeah <laughs> full bore crazy I was a problem child <laughs> probably a problem adult no 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 you know d d d after you come back from an expedition right uh, Conrad like After you come back from an expedition, it changes you as a human being? Every expedition? There's always something one learns on an expedition. And you're trying to learn more about yourself, but you learn about your partners and the environment, the, yeah. the weather, the, the glaciers and things like that. But a good expedition is one that two or three weeks after the expedition, I have these really intense dreams. And then that's like a success of an expedition that there's there's some moment of that climb that's just super vivid. It's in your life and like, phew, there it is. So if you remember your dreams, yeah, not 
you have to work at remembering your dreams. Yeah, you really have to like do the homework to remember. Have a little journal. Talk about them the first thing when you wake up. Know what type of sleep you are in. Hmm. And it's a good incentive to not drink at night, so you're when you, you sleep better. And when you those those intense dreams that mm-hmm. are yeah those those are yeah get a dream logbook because I've I've had dreams where people that they come and they and they're there and obviously it's they're not it's not like Hanuman here yeah. <laughs> or Ganesh or, you know uh, these are physical items we're looking at here but they're they're so vivid and real hmm. and they'll ask you questions so hmm. somebody in the dream is going to ask you questions yeah or question something or mm. so yeah it's they're always yeah like with Alex Lowe who I and I've had three very distinct like dreams that that had meaning to each one of them hmm and those were always in a in a sense and were the dreams guiding you towards something they were guiding me but it was also in a sense the 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 two early ones it was we hadn't attended to Alex's body he disappeared in the snow avalanche yeah. and then yeah. no death certificate and it was problematic so but it was like he could have survived and having to go through the the working with from within the in it was in Shishapong in Tibet yeah. and then coming to the embassy here in Kathmandu and yeah having to work with the staff there and they the issuing a death certificate is a serious business when you don't have a body hmm. and so what happened to me and then getting interviewed by three different uh consular officers to make sure that i wasn't um fabricating something but it was obvious i mean i was beat up and yeah. you know there's eight people that watched it and we had movies we were making a movie so it was very clear i mean we had film of that so mm. but it was still but then that dream came to me and it was like hey i'm here i never left but then mm. there was some um, and then another time while well, in the lung tong you can look over it and you see shishapong on the other side it's yeah. close to it that, that that drainage and and then so but it was yeah there were, and then yeah there but people that understand their dreams or there's a lot of creativity in them yeah you write them down the people that interpret dreams in in many cultures are revered or understood mm. or they're they they see things and i have no idea <laughs> do you see the dreams before or after after so if i know if i have a dream and then i'll um I'll wake up and I'll jot it I'll jot down like five key points and who mm. was in that dream and then talk about it at breakfast. And so with family. With family. Or friends whoever are. There. Yeah, there's yeah. but when we were growing up when the kids were young we'd be like oh what did we dream about last night and hmm oh I didn't dream about anything. But we all we're dreaming it's part of the rapid eye movement phase of sleep and it's healthy for us and it's sort of defragging the hard drive up upstairs and you wake up and you're like so <laughs> i feel you yeah, podcasts are fun because we have this unlimited <laughs> rabbit hole of like topics we can just kind of like keep noodling around in <laughs> uh, no i'm trying to i'm trying to figure out all the crazy dreams that i've ever seen in my life right but i've never seen a dream which which relates to some an incident that has happened in my life before before seeing that yeah. dream generally i see a dream and then it's like let's say something related to what i'm about to do probably yeah. the dream is going to help me out yeah on something that i'm about to do in the dream probably i've already done it and do you recognize people in your dreams oh that's a good one i see myself falling sometimes so. yeah i have a, a recurring falling dream and it was um there's two dreams i had recurring and that i haven't they haven't visited me in the last probably 5 6 years but one was young and it was kind of being punctual and being ready that's just what i was taught as a kid yeah, and yeah, i same. the one there would always be this dream that i missed the airplane 
Uh-huh. Um, and then it was like, God, I never missed airplanes. And his one dream was like, then the airplane took off at, at the old Kai Tak airport in Hong Kong, which is like right mm-hmm. there. I mean, it was just like, you land, it was in like, look like in the yeah, ocean. Yeah. And I would like have these dreams that I'd visit that airport in, in 92. And it was like, that was in the dream. And so I'd, like I'd miss the plane and then I'd be oh shucks. And then the plane would crash and there'd be like these fiery things. And then the other dream was that I would be flying around up in, in trees and, and jumping and, and swinging, like climbing tree parkour, if you will. And then I would fall from the trees. Yeah. But I'd always land on my feet in like like, like a like a cat like, like a cat yeah. land and I'd be a, a w- wake up but it wasn't it wasn't uh, you not know where you're gonna be Has but then it, other yeah. dreams climbing dreams I'll I'll, I'll remember a, a specific like there I was I that one pitch so and the deeper you go in your quest of what it might be yeah whether it's running a hundred kilometers or learning to recite a lengthy poem. Anytime you dig deep and have to think about things inside, those those moments reach in and are they're what the foundation of our dreams. Yeah. Yeah. Do you ever see a dream where you've already reached the summit of let's say a mountain or some something where you're about to do and you've already succeeded? No. They're more with people that I that I work with or I know or in a capacity one way or another. And it was I, mean, I had a really good dream just a few days ago that I, I woke up and I was just like I woke up and I thought I was like, oh, I'm on expedition. I'm in, in base camp and I'm it was like in that what the mode that you do when you're in the mountains and you're yeah. helping people out and you're doing things. And it was, but I was in the hotel room. <laughs> <laughs> when you woke yeah. up. <laughs> uh, is, it, is it March, April already? <laughs> is the air conditioner going? <laughs> so. Yeah. No, but, but the thing is, is it, a, is it like a, you, you said such an interesting thing, helping people out, right? Is it, is it problem solving now or was it always problem solving back in the day? When you were in your, let's say, in your 20s, right? When you're just starting off, was it problem solving then or is it problem solving, like, has the scale become bigger now? It's still fundamentally that problem solving. And I like that, that creative approach to things. And that's one of the, the, and for the Nepali people, they're very resourceful. And I love that resourcefulness. And I've learned so much from climbing with Nepali climbers up in the high mountains and how to take care of your body and how to work together as a team. They, everyone goes like, they go together. You know, in the U.S., it'll be like, they'll just walk slowly all day. And then there'll be like five or ten Nepalis, and they do it together, and then they rest together. And there's, there's a community spirit that, that builds strength with that. And that was evidenced in uh, the, the winter ascent of K2. I mean, it was all Nepali, and they're going to do it for Nepal and their country and, and, and national pride, but they weren't going to be carrying triple loads for a, a client, some guy that looks like me. I want to be the first guy, so you have to carry my stuff up there. They did it. It was full Dalbot power. <laughs> <laughs> we like that. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to keep that. Do you remember the first time you ate Dalbot? <laughs> I was probably on the hike into Jerry or I don't know, maybe in India. Yeah, probably in India. So <laughs> the first Dalbat, the first momos. Yeah, yeah. I'll never forget the first momos. Yeah, first momos, first Dalbat. That I remember the first time I had pizza and I had like you know I, I, I don't know if I can call it American food, but you know like I don't know what's American food though. And I just think about mac and cheese. No, <laughs> what can I? It's do? not very good. Yeah, it's convenient. <laughs> it's convenient. But there's Nawari food like fried long. Yeah. Oh. You like it? Yeah. Yeah, because because one more thing in common, I love Foxo. <laughs> it's called Foxo. I, yeah. I, love, I love that. Yeah, a people lot. are like, oh my God, that's crazy or something like that, but fried sheep lung, so. <laughs> that's the best thing. Come to Nepal, folks, and have some fried sheep lung. <laughs> yeah. I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to imagine as we were talking, imagine how the expedition was back in uh, 53. Yeah. The. I mean, they left the Kathmandu Valley, and they would have to hike that whole distance. Um, huge army of people, and it was unknown. I mean, the 
Nepal was a closed up kingdom and it was, but it was, um, we've come a long ways since then. I mean, it was 70 years ago and as a society we're, we're much different and that, um, and that was the, the, the origins of expedition climbing are very much rooted in imperialism and colonialism. There's no question about that. And there's, um, that, that part of it, but it was in a sense, John Hunt, who was the leader of the yeah. 53 Everest expedition, one, he realized that Tenzing Norgay was the strongest climber in the group. He had more experience. He'd gotten to the South Summit the previous fall with the Swiss expedition, so they knew what was going on. But that combination of, of Hillary and Norgay was, um, it came at a momentous moment. It was seven years after the end of the Second World War. Yeah. The world wanted something that was aspirational and uplifting and that it was um, um, uh, people from Nepal and, a, and, a, and, and from New Zealand that it, was, it wasn't just the white guys that stood up there, that it was a partnership. And I think that, that origin story for the Sherpa culture, the people that yeah. work in the mountains, and then the greater flywheel of Nepal is really important. And Tenzing Norgay is, is seen as a, as a hero to Nepal. And... Darjeeling and uh, the hill people. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That bond uh, of uh, Sherpa Tending and uh, Sir Edmund Hillary is something that's uh, that's that's definitely a fulfilling moment for the planet, right? In in fifty three, just imagining this, right? In fifty three, as we were talking about dreams, in fifty three, the amount of the amount of effort. The, well, I just don't have words, but the amount of effort. I'll just stick to that. And now, in, in, in 2023, the amount of efforts of climbing Everest, is it the same? How would we put it? it altitude is going to be altitude. Yeah. So the millibars HG pressure that, what, 9,000 meters is, is going to remain constant. But the tools we use are vastly improved. Yeah. And so um, starting with boots, closed cell foam insulation and... There's, they're all synthetic, so there's no leather to absorb water. The break-in time is really good. They much less. They weigh much less. Um, down suits. Um, we know more about hydration. And a lot of this they had going in '53, but we really think back 100 years ago to 21, 22, and 24, the, the early Everest expeditions. Yeah, that was. Yeah. Um, they the didn't have Mallory, that. Uh, Mallory expeditions. Yeah, coming up, it'll be June 8th next year, or 24th. It'll be 100 years since his uh, passing on the, yeah. on the mountain. Yeah, yeah. How has it changed in, let's say, like the, the expedition back and then from John Mallory to coming to the, the the Hunt expedition and now in 23? And then how is it going to be, like, what do you think is going to happen in the next 50 years when we come to, yeah. let's say, 27, 73, let's say, right? Yeah. How is it going to change? Yeah, the um, there was unknown territory and every time someone does a route it becomes easier because that psychological barrier has been broken so the people that draft in behind them they're the they have it a little bit more um they have it easier because someone's been there be uh, ahead of time but we look at the amount of helicopters that fly up in the mountains now and people flying to camp two and down and and the use of helicopters in the mountains and there's um yeah, it's there's more people on the mountain, 450 or so last year, and it was the most highest fatality rate last year because of that. So, there, there, if there is a good comprehensive care and capacity study on Everest yeah. that is done by the Nepali government with Nepal leaders and students that covers everything from the the cryosphere, which is the ice, to the rock, the air, earth sciences, that basic and wildlife, and then the cultural aspect to it, the how we quantify what a, a good experience is. Mm. So too many people doesn't make for a good experience in the traffic jams that you see up, up at the second step and or the Hillary step, or they all add to it. But then kind of figuring that out, and then how do you how do you limit all that, how do you limit it? And you do it by experience, which is like, if you're gonna go climb Janu or one of the technical peaks, you, your experience, you have to have it to get you there. But because you have people helping you out, you can get in with less experience. And so 
Do you limit the people by experience? Do you limit it by, by money? So just who has the most money can pay for it, or you do it by 100% lottery. So totally randomized. And the solution working on that is probably working all three of those things and finding out a way that mm. that is equitable for the 400 people or so that are going to try to climb Everest each year in the pre-monsoon season. Mm. 400 and let's say another thousands of people who are going to be the yeah. the back support. Yeah. Uh, if I can put it that way. Yep. Yeah, it's a one to two or one to three ratio. It's yeah, and there's using a lot of oxygen up there. And every time to carry that oxygen up there, it's on the back of a Nepali climber. So, How is it going to be in the next 50 years? What do you think? We're not going to be hit around. Yeah. Uh, probably we will, probably you will. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. but Yeah, little, yeah I'm 60, so <laughs> I won't make to 110, but it, it is. Maybe you will. You never know. <laughs> yeah, yeah we're, we're living longer now. <laughs> yeah, and that's uh, part of the, the population growth is that we're inherently living longer in, in addition to um, a few of the other that, that go into it, but the um, the mountains are going to be vastly different. What's happening now in the ice-clad mountains around the world, the isotherm, so where it stays frozen and not frozen, is moving up, and so there's that ice that holds the mountains together is losing its strength, and then yeah. as they they're but ice is destroying them too because it's 10 to 12 percent larger than water. Mm-hmm. So when it goes in the crack and it freezes up, it pushes the cracks out and the rocks fall off and that freeze thaw cycle. But when the ice isn't there, these mountains are going to they're going to fall down, slide off, and there'll be some pretty big mass wasting events, uh-huh. which is when you have a, a landslide or something like that. Mm-hmm. Is it going to be more riskier down the road as we go along? The if risk level is going to... Yeah, get, if, if it's on a snow and ice route, the, the, yeah, if it melts out, it might be... It's hard to say. You, have to, you can't say it's abroad. It'll be more dangerous. So, But if it all melts out, then, then there's no ice, then you're rock climbing. Hmm. That's not going to happen in 50 years, but where we are now until we figure out our carbon conundrum and how much fuel we use and now we understand climate science and what's going on in this planet that we have to hmm. and that's why the idea with the uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> the hydro monster the water maker <laughs> no let's jump into that that that's something that's that I 100% wanted to go ahead and talk about it's so interesting right I, I remember sitting no it's just coming back to me I remember sitting down with Kamarita Dai um, mm-hmm. I'm yeah. sure you're friends with him, right? Yeah. He's a legend. Um, and I remember sitting down with him, and he was, he, was, he was telling me that, Sanjay, the same path that I took uh, when I was climbing in the first few expeditions, now it's it's different. Like, now it's full of, if, if I'm not mistaken, he was telling me, there's no, there's no glacier there. Like, it's different. And yep. then every time I go up, it's different. Like, you know, for, for, for a certain time, I was used to... Uh, you know, when you're walking the same path, I'm sure you, yep. you, you know, I'm sure you have waypoints. I don't know how to say it. I'm not mm-hmm. a mountaineer, but uh, waypoints or you have a fair enough idea because you've been there before. Yeah. But now things are different. Like from the beginning of my expedition, beginning of my journey in mountaineering, and now every time I go up, it's different. Like the mountain has changed itself in a span of two decades. And in another, I don't know, in another five decades, I'm just putting five decades a number. Maybe we can just go like a century. Things might be completely different. We might not even have the rocks and, uh, sorry, the glaciers and the snow at all. Is that possible? Yeah. When, probably not in five decades, but yeah, it's certainly. And if they did a study at the South Pole in 2019 yeah. with a, um, a research expedition studying the ice, and it's the it's not replenishing there. So there's not young ice. The ice that they're finding is a thousand years old. So when you get these warm days, when it rains at eight thousand meters, it just changes the whole um, characteristics of the mountain. Hmm. All around the world. All around the world. Yeah, there, especially the. High altitude, low latitude, which is what the Himalaya is. And yeah. then you have um, 
high latitude, so that's Alaska and Norway and Siberia, places like that, that these, they, they, there's greater temperature fluctuations and mm. warming. So it's getting, climate change is more active in Montana, where I'm from, than it is, say, in Kansas or something like that. Mm. Because it's a flat place and things aren't quite, there's not that warming and that change in it, so. Hmm. How is it going to be towards our side of the planet? Towards the... Uh, our side of the planet, the Himalayan region oh. right here. Well, this is the water tower of Asia. So five of the world's great rivers and support so many between India and, and Nepal. And there's still going to be... The glaciers hold the water and they let it out slowly in the, in the, in the summer. So um, when you look at rivers that don't have a lake or... A glacier on it, then the water can be seasonal flow. So, the immediate, if, as things warm up, they'll um, there'll be more runoff, and that's the risk of a glacial lake outburst flood. Yeah, and that is the water that comes up between a, a terminal moraine that was pushed there 14, 20,000 years ago, last surge in ice, and then it backs up, and then water fills up, and then there's a trigger, which might be an earthquake, and you have a, a flash flood. So, being aware of that and and assessing how much water is held in these high alpine lakes and what the problems are with that is sort of the near term. But then as mm. it dries up, how's, how, how will that be? And water is, is, is – clean water is essential for life. And yeah. we, we take it for granted, same thing with air, but we have to kind of balance it out and realize our impact on air and water. Yeah, yeah. X, open up the uh – uh, you posted this in the morning, and um, I, I, would, I would love it if you could explain it to everybody who are listening to us at the moment. Yeah, so <laughs> sitting in a tent in Alaska, and an idea that a how to get fresh water and electricity. Yeah. So, a couple challenges. One, the sea ocean is rising up. So, if you're maritime, you look at these computer models of places that. Um, like in Bangladesh, you know, mm. is the rising, and then you have surge tides and during the monsoon, and and, and so there's the, the oceans are getting. We might more not volume. even have a few countries in X amount of time. Yeah, yeah. Maldives is an yeah, example. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you know, there's a a nation that's paying the consequence for the West. And same thing with Nepal. I mean, Nepal per capita doesn't have a a carbon footprint like someone like myself from the United States, and so they're. They suffer the consequences of a warming planet. But with the ocean rising up, we know that we, there, there's an opportunity there. So if we take water out of the ocean, and then you can either get a – in a few places like the Dead Sea, it's below, so it would siphon right in. But mm. you'd probably have to bring it up on the land. So mm. you're going to kind of create a closed – loop type system but taking saline water and then that goes into a solar furnace so mm -hmm. imagine a big column and then there's 10,000 concentric mirrors around that that are then programmed to f bounce that sun right onto that solar still and then that water is flash boiled yeah gets to a temperature of 3500 degrees celsius and that steam spins turbines yeah. creating electricity and then as that condenses, you then have fresh water for... And so I think about it, coming mm. here to um, Nepal, I flew through um, Qatar, and when you come in landing, it's, it's, it's very dry. And the, what the resource is to boil water or to use pressure osmosis to force the salt out are very energy intensive. So yeah. by using this idea, you can like create water with without without it you know just there <laughs> mm. we need to use the power of the sun yeah more and more and this is and it, it, i'm not an engineer is it more efficient to have photovoltaic cells to create electricity and then run that but the photovoltaic cells are going to they require mining and there's an imprint on those and just having the sun bounce off this big steel thing and I mean they could probably run it 24 hours because they if they got to that temperature mm. you can store that that energy and keep spinning it so there's but it would have to like when the sun goes down then you remove the the tray and the the 
Uh, we give it a try in a small small scale model. We we'll definitely go ahead and test it out, right? Yeah. So students from Tuberon University, this is it. KU, KU, KU I want to put KU, KU guys yeah. there too. Well, both of them, yeah. So, <laughs> TU and KU. Yeah, you get the uh, yeah the Nepali students. This this would be. I'm going to take this. You, you, you know, such an interesting thing. Next week, I've got uh, a friend of mine who um, runs the department of uh, hydrogen, if I'm not mistaken. Green hydrogen, sorry. Green hydrogen in KU. And then I'm going to, I'm going to make sure that I send it to him. Yeah. And uh, he's coming in uh, next week. So the funny thing is, when, when I started this podcast, right in the beginning, uh, during COVID, I'd invited him. And now, after two years, their program is evolved and it's definitely scaled up and then we're just doing a two-year run of how it has been so if it, if it's okay with you i'm gonna oh, pass. this is open source <laughs> there i'm not expecting any money from this <laughs> just happiness my happiness is helping out people so this would be a good lift but yeah 80 percent of africa lies between 23 and a half north and 20 and a half south and 60 yeah. percent south america and mm -hmm. think of the dry places yeah. Nepal has hydro potential, huge hydro potential. That, I mean, they're not. I, I, I'm not in the, knowing that, but seeing, say, some of the villages that now have small scale uh, hydroelectric projects that yeah. are electrifying is really helpful for the people. Yeah, wind as well. I've seen small scale wind turbines in uh, upper regions of our country as mm -hmm. well, and that's. I'm sure you've seen that too. And uh, that's such a fascinating. Uh, a way to go ahead and produce energy as well as high up in the mountains as well. I'm sure we could, down the road, we could definitely come up with new ideas to, yeah. to go ahead and uh, uh, to go ahead and power up uh, aspects of it. In the 90s though, like I'm sure it was, it was very tricky when you were, when you were here and uh, now we've evolved as well and we've, 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 we've been able to go ahead and, you know, make the experience better of uh, climbing mountains. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you like to go ahead and define that in the span of three decades? There, there I mean, it was the, the kerosene stove, and so that was always, it added an, a nice flavor to the food. And then now it's LPG, which is the big red cylinders, and that's what basically all of Kathmandu cooks with, and those are used on expeditions, so it's easier, less maintenance and things like that. So, yeah. But there, it's still the, you go to the mountains, set up camp, Look at your objective, acclimate, get used to the air, <laughs> and then go. <laughs> so. Oh wow! And then and then go, huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, you came there to go, not yeah. to, to sit around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, this man, this might be a tough question, but um, I'm just gonna go for it. You've lost friends in various expeditions around the world. The dreams that you were talking about. When friends come back in the dreams, do they come back in, in your dreams? I've had a few of them, yes, the people that, that have. Um, but they're always like, hey, things are okay. Yeah. It's, it's affirming. It's not like a, a scary. Like I have these dreams that I fall out of the canopy of trees, but I land on my feet like a cat and wake up and <laughs> yeah. go have some chai masala in the morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but yet the dreams I have with people that I've, I've lost – tend to be affirming like hey i'm okay i came to visit you to say hello yeah i'm not a mystic and, and so i mean we all dream you just have to learn to listen to your dreams and yeah. study them and i don't know if study is the right word but mm. let them in let your dreams there <laughs> and live your dreams everyone's like oh live your dreams yeah, and, yeah. and they're they're yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah i mean live your goals live your aspirations and understand your dreams there's right. a dream like, oh, I dream of speaking Sanskrit fluently. No, it's going to take me hard work if that was going to be my goal. I would have to study for five years and do nothing but that. Mm. But a dream is like, whew, came through. What did it tell me? <laughs> You've seen death close by? How close? Ooh, yeah, there are, um, yeah, the accident with Alex was, and David Bridges, I mean, I walked away from it, so there... But it, um, and then seeing deceased people on the mountain, and there. But if you, if you play this in this game that of high risk stuff, you have to make peace with death and your own mortality. And I think that there's a good understanding that comes from that. 
Yeah. Because now in the United States, we just push it off to the side. You don't see someone getting hurt or injured. Or it, it's rare. And then people grow old and they get moved into a hospital and eventually they take their last breath. But it's not like what it was in a very rural place or where childbirth is, is, is fraught with complications. You don't experience death in that same way. Mm. But yet in our culture, we've, we've glorified it with these movies. And I don't go to violent movies. It's just, I don't, it's like bad medicine movies mm. where they kill people. I just don't, I mean, that's like a nightmare. Why would I pay to go watch someone shoot someone? Not your thing. No. Yeah, I'm like like a like a warm, fuzzy story that makes me feel good. I don't like violence. It's just there's yeah. Dahisma, right? The practice of nonviolence. We gotta live that. We need more people on that. Yeah. So we know there's the challenges we're all facing here and as we enter into this third decade of the twenty first mm. century, mm. COVID vastly disrupting of our planet yeah. and coercion, which is strong authoritarian leaders that, that when we went through four years, they know someone that's not going to play by the rules. And then conflict, which is, there's always conflict, regional conflict, but nothing on the scale of what the invasion of Ukraine is, which is vastly um, disrupting the world's food supplies. And there's a whole long tail to what that 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 aggression is is costing mm. not the least of which is I mean how many men from Russia have lost their lives and so you don't have those people to contribute to society to to innovate to work to to move that ball of knowledge forward they're gone and all these wars they they take people out and then they have to rebuild from it mm. Have you have you ever thought that I survived and there is a purpose that I have to go ahead and fulfill? Yeah, there. I yeah, having walked away from enough of this and having a list of friends that have not made it. Non sequential death is difficult for people, hmm. and so when your grandparents if, have they passed away, yeah, yeah, and so it was accepted. You would. It was like a pet. You learn about death and grandparents pass away and, and children are born. But when it's non-sequential, yeah. like you're taken out in the prime of your life, it, especially in your 20s, it's really difficult. Mm. I can understand loss and death at age 60 different than I did when I was 29, the first time that my mentor, Muggs, when he died, that was my first time with like, boom, I'm going to have to deal with loss, I'm going to have to deal with grief, I'm going to, my, my world came unglued. Yeah. And it's different when you're at that in your 20s and 30s because the world is so much ahead of you. Like I can talk about 50 years from now and if I'm 110, yeah, I'll probably be living on <laughs> watermelon juice with no teeth. But, but when you're in your 20s, you think about, yeah, you'd be 70 and, and there's so much potential left in your life. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The fulfillment is the fulfillment is keep on moving forward and keep on doing good things. That's that's I think I believe that's something that's going to keep you going and keeping your friends' legacy alive. Yeah, they're to they're yeah. What can you do to give back? What can you do to help someone out? And the foundation of that is a smile. It costs nothing. It's free. And you know, that's what I like in Nepal. Everyone's smiling. <laughs> they're just smiling at me because they're like, oh. But it's always this good <laughs> – you know, the patao driver, I'm like, hey, buddy, where are we going? <laughs> you know, they look at it and they're like, oh, you got your picture there. That's you. And they're always excited like this is going to be a good ride. And it's definitely uh, – been my form of adventure here the last couple of weeks as I'm in Kathmandu. <laughs> Running around in Patel. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, Let me ask you this. What are you afraid of now? Afraid of now? Yeah. Um, the, uh, the conservative rulers in the United States, they, they, they scare the shit out of me. Politics? Just, yeah, they're just... They're mean. They're they're 
they're self-serving and it's minority rule and we're losing democracy as what we were supposed to be this great nation. I mean, obviously our history is fraught with indigenous taking land and then slavery and, and our, as a country not having fully come to terms with that. But then we're also, hey, we're freedom. We solved the World War II and this is what democracy can look like and that was like the export. And we lost that. People aren't – they're like, yeah, you had an authoritarian leader in there that, that threw a wrench in everything. And, and, and that divisiveness in the United States is, is, is worries me because we're not going to move ahead unless we all kind of make a, a conscious effort to do this. And when I talk like this, I get these people like, well, you just – yeah, you're spent too much time at altitude or stay in your lane, do climbing, don't get involved in this and, oh, it's too idealistic. But mm. we're not going to get there unless we all have ideals. And values that we're going to live for. And if we say this is what we want to do and you're going to approach life with that, then we all get into that and, and into being less confrontational and mm. more supportive of our fellow humans. And that, yeah. <laughs> no, fair enough. I, I remember this term. Uh, I was sitting down with a friend of mine and uh, – when when you're trying to go ahead and do something together, uh, I, I really don't want to go ahead and get into the gist of what my friend does, but you just you just think about the guy on your left and the guy on your right, and you move forward with it. You make sure that you take care of him, and you take care of the other one, guy or girl, because you know that that person's going to take care of you if something goes wrong. Is it something similar in um, – I'm not going to touch politics right now. Something similar in mountaineering as well? 100%. When you – we are together on a team and then you're watching out for each other and that connection as a team mm. is good. Because when we think about team sports or any of these sports, we have a human construct. Yeah. So we start with time. Then we put a ball in there and then we add rules and we pit human against humans and someone's always going to lose. So when you go climbing, you and I climb together, our adversary is gravity, altitude, snow, weather, all that. It's not another human. And it's not another human based on a human construct of rules and things like that. So mm. there's not a more primal way for humans to connect than when they're out in a risky situation and you have to rely on the other person to get through it. And that bond that we have is, is healthy. Yeah. That's a good thing that we can build on. Hmm. Hmm. Is there ever moments where, you know, you're like in, in fear of like, okay, I might not come back? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I might not. <laughs> is that something that keeps you going? Yeah, there's, I mean, we all, I mean, life is finite and we don't know when our last breath is and it's, we don't want to be deciding our own last breath. So we leave that aside, but there you live life to the fullest. So I'm gonna t now, now I'm gonna touch into politics, right? Yeah. Isn't it the same 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 thought process that everybody needs to have? I'm just talking about everybody. I'm not trying to get into one's one's pick of uh, politics in one country, right? All around the world. Yeah. You do good by the people on your left, people on your right, wherever you are, whoever is next to you. You just do good by the person next to you. Yeah. And in, in, in where I am in the United States, it's, it's, it's competition, it, it's battle, it, it's conflict, it's strife, it's, it's using negativity to advance one's thing on that makes it um, – that makes it more difficult in there. But yeah, the, the more that we can take a deep breath and not necessarily treat other people like – I would like to be treated, mm. but treat other people how they would like to be treated. And that takes effort. You have to learn what that is. And so an example of that is, say, if I go to Pashupati and I see a sadhu and like I'm not going to go in there with my climber mindset or a party mindset. I'm going to go in there respecting that person's space yeah. and try to understand it, but not kind of overbear them with my presence and so treating them as they would like to be treated and it takes time to understand what everyone else wants to be treated mm. because it was like treat them as you'd like to be treated well some people 
they treat themselves like shit. They beat them, they're hard on themselves. I mean, we're all guilty of that. We get down and we get depressed, but then pulling out of that and getting into something where you're you're there to to uplift other humans. It's like a it's like the most fun. It's like it it, it feels good. <laughs> All right. Of course it does. No shadow of a doubt on that. Was, but why are we? Why is as an individual we yeah. we live by this? But society wise, everything it, we're at conflict. We want to see. You no, know, it's. Uh, I did a movie on it. I did a movie a couple of years ago, and in the movie, there's a Nepali dialogue. <laughs> I'm going to try to translate it in English as as yeah. I go along. It says, "When you go out and see somebody else going through trouble, maybe the person has to go out and pay." pay up uh, his or her dues. Maybe that person's suffering in health or maybe that person's suffering in general, right? When we look at somebody else, we just sit and we just chit-chat, oh, that poor, poor person is going through that, right? But when it happens to us, when we are suffering, when we're going through pain, when we're going through hardships, right? That's when we really know what the other person had to go through. So sometimes you have to go through the, go through all those things to understand that other person's pain. You, you kind of get me what I'm trying to yeah. trying to say, right? Not everybody goes through that hardship and that pain. So probably not everybody understands it or probably needs to understand it. But once they go through that, because in a process of life, they have to go through it. Every human being probably goes through suffering at one point. Life is suffering. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as somebody somebody said this, as soon as we're born, we need to breathe, to breathe and to go through all of that process is like every breath is to suffer. So you have to take it as 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 you go along with all the experiences, with all the hardships that you go through. Then you're gonna understand that other person's pain. I don't know if I'm saying it right, but. I guess with experience, we learn how to be better human beings. Yeah, we do. But if we, if my recreation is involves a suffering component, and climbing Everest is suffering, there's nothing. <laughs> you're not sitting on the beach having a bar of singa and reading the newspaper or a book. You're, yeah, you're you're sick. You're uh, you're cold. It's matter, but it's good fun. But if you go through suffering on by your own choosing, by your own volition, saying, I'm going to I'm going to endure some hardship for an intangible, intrinsic reward. And it's mm-hmm. what we do in whatever. But if you, if you can comprehend suffering, then you have empathy for the person that's suffering. And so if you've spent a night out without a sleeping bag and had to shiver through the whole evening and just running out of food, then if you see someone that's not doing well that's living on the streets there's yeah. you can you know, like yeah that and they're not doing it because it's their path to self-actualization which is what is a grandiose way of saying why we go climbing because we want yeah. to self-actualize they're doing it because they have no choice they have no choice yeah. they're poor um society for many different reasons is they're on the edge of it and so but it's yeah i'm constantly fascinated by the human condition and where we are and how we yeah. approach other people and what that and what that looks like two different extremes right Ooh, there are two different extremes that we just talked about a person who is suffering who really doesn't have much who is probably sleeping in the streets without anything who is suffering in the cold and then another extreme where you're trying to go out and challenge yourself Probably, I'm just putting it out yeah. there. Challenging yourself is like climbing a mountain. Yeah, they're spending isn't it a hundred thousand dollars or fifty thousand dollars to go climb a mountain, and yeah, they're it's a different and understandably, and you can see how people see it as being selfish, but it's there is knowledge to be had. <laughs> In your twenties, <laughs> the thought process was probably different. To, to going out to in, in enjoying things or yeah to going out and enjoying things yeah but it was I grew up with my parents and it was like we did things we did community things and whether it was helping people out or helping out nature there was there was always a component of our day or whatever that we yeah. would do that was like giving back and that was pretty I mean, my parents both passed away but 
they they shared that with yeah. me like we had to do community have to give back to yeah and and i see now where i am that guys like me have been hoarding power and wealth and all that for centuries and now is it's a reckoning and so what can i do can i there's you can look at the money end of it but the other one is just saying we need to be an agent of change mm. and so there's elected officials in the United States that are my age, but they're they're playing like bullies and they want giving themselves tax breaks. And I mean, it's just a different, like, where is our empathy for other humans? And that that is, um, it's a little, little bit of a, a, a question that they're, I mean, I'm an optimist and I think that more people will have perfect human harmony. I mean, once we figure out fuel and population and, and like we stabilize where we're yeah. at and we don't yeah. kill ourselves by our own excess and, and, and become extinct, like we're at a really key point in this next 200 years. So how do we address peak carbon? So the atmosphere and a, a changing climate and what's that going to look like? How many people can this planet sustain? Those, those big questions. For, for for me, just to touch base on this, I, I have to go ahead and uh, I question my own people because uh, as as we talked about a while back, we personally for me, I don't have to go far for motivation. I just go to the airport and I look at my brothers and sisters flying out uh, yeah. for work. So uh, we have our own battles to go ahead and uh, uh, conquer right here in <laughs> in Kathmandu, right here in Nepal itself. So we have our own set of problems too. Just just adding it out there. Uh, bigger, larger problems. Fossil fuels is something that uh, we have to be carbon neutral. There is no doubt on that. A couple of days ago, I was watching the launch of the new uh, new phone that has just arrived in the planet, uh, and uh, at least Apple's trying to go ahead and go a little bit uh, carbon neutral. They've, they've got their own plans. Big multinational companies are definitely going to go, go ahead and do that, but we have to come with alternate energy. That I'm sure you're a big believer in that as well. Yeah, there's, um, and we need we need market support for these type of this technology. It's going to take people being innovative, thought leaders to create. How would, how do we solve this? And it's yeah. not anything that's that is a hard solution is going to require hard work to get there. There are no easy questions to climate change. There are no easy answers. Pardon me. There are no easy answers to climate change. Everything's going to require a compromise on one way or another. And I see, yeah, my flight here to Nepal costs X amount of carbon, and mm. it's you know, way more than what a villager in the Terai might use in 10 years of their life, living you know, in a small propane gas tank and not having to have the need for heating a house like you do up north or something like that. So there's... Definitely thought within that. In in time, in time, we'll definitely go ahead and work towards that. And we are already working towards that. There's so many different things that we're doing right here in government of Nepal. And uh, hopefully things are going to happen all across the world as well. And that's something that, uh, well, I'm pretty optimistic as well. Because I personally want to go ahead and make sure that I leave our mountains full of snow and glacier for, I don't know, probably our grandkids and their grandkids, because that's what we're working towards, isn't yeah. it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they're the, um, the responsibility that we have for future generations is not to be, one to be taken lightly. And that we're such a fast, like fast fashion, you heard about seven different styles in a year, and it's like... I mean, I wear a blue shirt and black pants. <laughs> I'll wear a blue shirt and black pants 10 years from now. So I'm in really simple clothing. But we're, that fast fashion is now a mindset. Maybe that mindset was the start of fast fashion where it's just it, – it's too quick. It's poorly made. It's, it's, it's built to be obsolete in mm -hmm. a short period of time, planned obsolescence. But that there – that we look at the long term, like how – what is that going to be? And you know, we, if you invest in children at a young age in, in children's education and helping out the disadvantaged children, those children 
become adults in 20 years and they're mm. what they're able to bring to society is mm. is is a good investment within it mm. so mm. Let me ask you this. A, a while back, we, we, we spoke about uh, being the first, right? The first to do this. As human beings, we have that drive. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have to challenge ourselves or be, be challenged. While doing that, we put a lot of human lives at risk. Even our lives and the lives of team members and the lives of a lot of people, a lot of support team, right? And our friends. And they're our not friends. even participating. And family, they're not participating on it. Of course. They pay collateral damage, too, if something goes wrong. Of course. Is it worth it? Yes. There's no... I mean, we do it. We have this one life to live. And, yeah, their loss on an individual basis is tragedy. And it mm. is... It really kind of, it, yeah, for the friends and family, it's, it's a really, it's a tough go. But with 7.4 billion people on this planet, there's, I mean, as we've had our interview here, there's been probably a few hundred people that died within Nepal just of natural cause and around the rest of the world. And so yeah. they're, 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 on a big collective thing, I don't think that it's it's a small thing. But again, it's a difference. People, you know, they'll society places a higher value mm. on on white lives than they do sub-Saharan African lives, mm. and that's a. It's I'm a, trying to crack that, and but that do you understand? Yeah, that? yeah, of course. There, yeah. So when a movie star has. Stubs are told it's all over the newspaper, but yet the the conflict in Sudan and Etria is ongoing, and it's based on water and, and resources, and there's people in really hurt and really suffering. But <laughs> at least we have these podcasts to get the conversations going. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I totally understand. I'll, I'll give you a perspective. There, the there's there are people in this war, in in my part of the planet where who who are getting penalized for having a disease that they were born with it was not their choice to go out and have the, have a disease like hiv aids but they were born with it and they get penalized for that in their school or uh, in their neighborhood you know or there's somebody in some part of the world who doesn't get clean water and uh, is probably dying right now so I totally understand what you're trying to say and what you're trying to work towards. And uh, it's something that I, I, I know that you're very passionate about to go ahead and make that change. For me, even if I change one person who is listening right now, who, whose mindset is probably slightly headed towards negativity and uh, probably comes back towards a positive <laughs> aspect. That one per I do this for that one person. Yeah who probably is going to change his or her mind and probably go ahead and uh, do something else, which is towards the positive side. I have one. Yeah. I see it that way. That's my own mountain yeah. that I climb. <laughs> and that person starts with you. When you, when you yeah. affirm life and you come, I mean, we've created positivity by having this conversation and we'll share it with other people and hopefully they'll takes take something away from it <laughs> yeah, hopefully hopefully a lot of positive things yeah. all right here we go easy things toughest yeah. mountain that you've ever climbed in your life <laughs> the toughest the toughest from like physical discomfort doing everest without supplemental oxygen it's just it's misery but the the meru peak with renan and jimmy that was yeah. like my the the apex of my climbing effort when was this again? Uh, 2011. 2011, right? In the Gangotri region of uh, yeah. in India, the source of the Ganga River. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Cliff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Man, just imagine. You know, I, I, for me, I'm like, yeah. you know, I, I just imagine things. I have the pictures memory, so that's how I go ahead and see it. Uh, Everest without, just just make me, and people who are listening right now, just, just making them understand, like, what goes through climbing again? Everest is the pinnacle, right? What key two I've heard is the most technical. Mm -hmm. What goes through? What goes through a mount, your mindset when you're climbing a mountain without oxygen? It's a, it's just kind of hazy. Hazy is not fun. So no, imagine no, no. what is it? Drinking warm champagne, cheap warm champagne on a sunny day. 
with a headache and then having to run uphill with a backpack on but only being allowed to breathe through a straw. <laughs> no, I'm not going to imagine that. <laughs> oh. So a bad champagne hangover and breathing through a straw and then sweating and freezing at the same time. Maybe that's what you need to do. You could go train. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> but it's um, yeah, going through it at the, at the time. You're, you're just mitigating the amount of pain that you're going through. So are my feet warm enough? But the scenery t- makes up for that. And then the connection you have with your climbing partner adds to that. And that, that human bond that we create is really special. Um, again, I, I made sound... Uh, obviously, I really don't care how I sound, right? There's one thing that I was taught when uh, I learned how to scuba dive, and there was one thing that I was taught by my um, uh, scuba dive buddy, my instructor, my master. When things are going to go wrong underwater, when things go wrong, and he said, oh, mark my words, there's going to be a time when something's going to go wrong in, in, in your life. First thing that you do is take harm. Things will go wrong. Just stay calm. Once you're calmed down, look for your body and then and then try to go ahead and ask for help. But first thing you gotta do, calm down. Oh yeah. Because you can't come up. When you when you're hundred feet below, you can't come up. Like you just can't. Yeah, you have to take your time and So with mountaineering, if things go wrong. What's the first thing that you got to go ahead and do? The, the calmness is a great way of, I mean, that will help you take a breath, look around, assess the situation. Don't put any rescuers in risk. Yeah. Um, go through it. But it's the people that remain calm in the mountains, they probably have a higher success rate. Because if you go in the mountains and you're scared, and you're like this, and you're anxious, and you're nervous, and you're like wound up, and I can't believe it's dry. And then next thing you know, you're peeing every 10 minutes, so you're dehydrated, and then you're not breathing properly. You forget to put sunblock on. It just kind of it, it builds up, and it, it just you can't get ahead of it. But if someone that's calm, they're like, okay, things are bad, but they're not that bad. <laughs> what can I do to, to make the situation a little bit better and a little bit safer with that? And ideally, when you're in a climbing situation, you, you want to be proactive and preventative enough that you're not going to let that situation develop. Hmm. So you look at the worst case scenario and you plan in reverse. So. What's the one thing that you can't plan? The weather. <laughs> we can, we're better at predicting, but you can't, yeah, you have no, yeah, here's the Meru trailer so Gee, um i okay <laughs> I, I have no words <laughs> I, I i'm running out of words oh my god sitting in our ledge yeah so. oh my god and this is meru so it's yeah. a sacred to the hindu religion and oh look at that <laughs> <laughs> how does this feel when you look at oh there you go there you go yeah, oh, a legend yeah. right there yeah when you look back, right, 10 years before, this is the, the, 2011, so this is yeah. 12 years ago, right? When you, when you look back at yourself, look back at the moments, X, yeah. play it, play it, play it. When you look back at the moments, right, what goes through your mind? Oh, what a beautiful trip that was. Yeah. And, and that I was thankful to Jenny for knowing that I wanted to climb it and going on three expeditions. Yeah. And so that, that connection to my family with that was, and I wouldn't have been able to do it without my family. So. Yeah. yeah, and the boys. And the boys, and they're and they're, we're there, and there's Renan climbing. Yeah. And some art. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, <laughs> you smile now. At that moment, I'm sure it was so different. <laughs> yeah. Oh. But it was good fun. Yeah. They, yeah. There, um, there goes the whole bag. <laughs> Boom. Uh, I've, I've, we've, I've always, uh, I've always talked about this with my friends. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, what do you call it? I'm a 1500 meter guy. Mm-hmm. I like it here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm sure there are a lot of friends who must be like, oh, we like it on the beach. Uh, I see my friends have climbed. I've now I've met you, and yep. 
you, you're a part of my life now and it's vice versa right i'll always be there vouching for you and uh, hoping for the best for the rest of my life and uh, i've always thought of there's going to be a deal probably when when you know i'll go and I just go out and explore the mountains or probably just go out and hang out in the base camp for a month and uh, just talk to friends probably that's something that has crossed my mind yeah. as well uh, the gravity of looking at some of just looking at not not imagining that you'll scale it but the but the gravity of just looking at a mountain what goes in your mind oh if it's something I mean, at this point, at age 60, it's, it's beauty. It's the force of nature created this mountain. And, yeah. and I'll look at it. Oh, there might be a root there or <laughs> but something like that. But it's also um, – I like looking at sacred peaks. So Guri Shankar is now yeah. a sacred peak. Machu Pichare, Kumbila, Kailash. Yeah. Um, and there's lots of local peaks too that, yeah. that people don't that, – that we don't climb on. And that um, – that that lack of human being there, I think, is nice. Like we're not going to go there. <laughs> Doing it for the first time, let's say, let's say, imagine that there there are certain peaks we have tons of peaks left that might the government might decide to go ahead and open up in the future to be the first one to get there. Yep. You know, th like. Does that something like that? Does that uh, make you interested oh, yeah. in doing it again? I'm motivated. You by, know, I'm a new root activist, so yeah. opening up new roots in the rock climbing type, but then also peaks, and I just like that. That no one's been there before on this one piece, this one fold of this beautiful planet that we're on, and that comes back to as you mentioned this fundamental drive that humans have to look over the horizon and cross the oceans and, and, and to learn and discover. You know, there's a, when I was very young, I remember watching uh, a movie and right at the end of the movie, it says that uh, the final frontier. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Star Trek. Yeah, of course. It's, it's mm -hmm. space. Yeah. <laughs> of course, they changed it from, uh, they changed it from one specific p person to, like, uh, you know, uh, to anybody yeah. who can go ahead and uh, go, go venture out in space. That's the final frontier of mankind. And I, I'll put it as mankind or humankind. Yeah. Uh, do you think there's going to be a time in, uh, in the future that we're going to go ahead and there are going to be mountaineers who are going to be climbing peaks beyond our planet? If there is, it, I, don't, I don't see any purpose to it. I mean, yeah. now that we can, go to, we can go visit Mars with technology, I mean, there's yeah. more technology in these smartphones than there is at, um, in, a, um, in what they landed the Apollo 11 on. Yeah, There's a calculator technology, like a basic calculator yeah. technology. Yeah, and that's what they use. But now we can have, you know, going to the ocean and in that, we can have a remote sensor bring that information back to us and mm -hmm. we can look at it there. So I don't see a need for us to... I mean, let's figure out water on planet Earth before we start looking for water on Mars. I mean, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of people that are... You know, we need more water, and it's continually a struggle. So, it's it's it, this conversation is definitely going to go into so many different ways because we're definitely going to go to space. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think we'll ever stop that. Yeah, but we definitely need to go ahead and look at things back home as well. Like like you were saying, space is something that's very fascinating for me. And I saw you were ta you tagged uh, uh, Dr. Tyson as well. I saw yeah. that you had t tagged him on yeah. uh, the latest post that you did, right? Yeah, see if he's uh, <laughs> gonna get ideas out there. Interested in it. Um, just touching base on this right to a stand, uh, you've 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 been with us for such a long time. You've, I'll, I'll talk about KCC for a, in, in a bit. What can what can we do to go ahead and boost our tourism at the same time, remembering and making sure that we do not we keep what we have, we don't destroy what we have, or uh, head towards destruction of what we have, even if it's in a very minor scale, but obviously we survive on tourism. Yeah, it's a second most important part of the Nepali economy. For me personally, I want to 
maybe in my lifetime, maybe not in my lifetime, hopefully in my lifetime, get rid of remittent and survive on tourism. And let's see what what other things that we have to offer. Maybe it's, it can be hydro, maybe it can be so many other things that we have that we haven't found out yet. But in, just in tourism, if you had to stick around and talk on this aspect, any anything that you'd like to add on? There, you know, if you're visiting a country, be respectful and yeah. and you're, you're there to rejuvenate and come home a happy person. But there, be respectful. Don't don't take too much, yeah. and that can be as simple as taking pictures, and someone doesn't want their picture taken, or they're kind of coming in there so that um but having the infrastructure that's set there for people to come and mm. then here in nepal there's the southeast asian tourists from mm -hmm. from india and thailand mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. vietnam china they're all coming in now and they're they're welcome and the infrastructure is there yeah 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 we could definitely go ahead and uh down the road, would you want to go out and see more peaks opening up? Yeah, hopefully. And as a way, I mean, there's the the big popular peaks. There's a line on them, Everest and Amadeblom, and the, so find incentivize people to go to other regions and other areas and and, and see the beauty in that. And that's you know, as a public climber, I I can do that by showing, hey, this is you can climb here in the off season, and it, you don't need a summit. You can go rock climbing, or you can yeah. There's a beauty in a 6,000 meter peak, and it's. And I, I, mean, I have the luxury of saying that because I've already been there. And <laughs> yeah. Someone that hasn't been there, they're like, I I, yeah, I want to. Yeah, then go do it. Have fun. I'm not going to begrudge you or hold you against yeah. it. So. Yeah. Uh, Everest is everybody's choice. There is only one, <laughs> and it seems to attract a certain type of like, hey, I'm going to go and, and then collect the summits, and so there's a, uh, and. Yeah, if that's their motivation in climbing, I'm not going to fault it. Yeah. And, they're, um, and we all, you know, through, we do it for the, the friendship we have with our friends, yeah. um, the friendship or the happiness it brings to us, different ways of looking at it. Uh, so you're a legend, and uh, somebody who is listening to this, one piece of advice you'd want to go ahead and give them if they want to go ahead and start their journey, not just in mountaineering, but start their journey in... Uh, being a part of uh, maybe someday climbing Everest, let's say. I'm just putting it out there, right? W would it be advice that you want to you want to give them? Um, do it because you love to do it. Yeah, and that's the foundation of it. Whether you, whatever your passion in life, whether it's art or chess or mountain climbing or engineering, just do it because you love doing it. And then start working on peaks that bring you that experience because if you just drop in on everest and spend a bunch of money on it and you don't have that climbing experience it's going to be kind of a miserable experience so if you are considering climbing everest and you're not from nepal spend do a few expeditions i mean i had done you know probably I mean, I'd already been climbing the Himalayas for 11 years before I went to Everest. So I'd yeah. been to 6,000 <laughs> meters. I'd been to 7,000 meters. And I was like, okay, finally I'm I'm getting the skills for this. But then you have other people that just roll in and they're like, yeah. oh, yeah, we're here. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just don't jump and dive into uh, getting to uh, the highest right away. Take your time. Enjoy the process of doing it. The sum is, is what motivates. It's what drives us, but the process, the climb itself, is that's the the intrinsic reward that that we seek. And that's I'm gonna to me intrinsic reward, something that makes me feel good. And and some people can say, yeah, owning yeah. a car makes me feel good, and I'm like happy for you. But a car to me is transportation that gets me to the place that allows me to have an experience. Wow. And that's what travel is. Yeah. So you get to see different people. You get to understand different people. Yeah. 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 The food, the culture, the yeah. the whole nine yards. <laughs> yeah. I'm reminded of this person called Anthony Bourdain at this moment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, was, he, he took life. Yeah. He went for it. And yeah. Yeah. He was hopefully going to be coming over to Nepal to work on a, um, on, on a, on a food cuisine show. Oh, yeah? Yeah. So... Missed opportunity. Yeah. It's most unfortunate. Anything that you feel like that you missed out on? 
Oh, <laughs> I was, yeah, there was a chance I was going to be part of this Anthony Bourdain thing and to, like, see Nepali street food and go do expedition cooking and, and be part of that. And so huh. if you are depressed, your fellow humans are there for you. Yeah. Don't do that to your people that are around you. And it's sad, but they're, I mean, yeah. Anyways, <clears throat> on that. Yeah. But anything yeah. that I've missed out and, you know, I'm, if I like, oh, this is what I wanted to do. I'm a living regret. There's nothing. Life is a linear experience. Yeah. Tomorrow's going to be the best day of my life. <laughs> Today is too. <laughs> yeah, right now is the best. It's the best 235. And, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, for me right now is the yeah. best time. I yeah. really don't know what's going to happen as soon as we step out of the studio or in another five seconds. I, I won't know that either. And I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to take a little bit of that from your side as well. I want to I talk about KCC right at the end. Uh, how, did, how did the idea of KCC come by and uh, and uh, where do we stand today? Yeah, so the Kumbu Climbing Center is uh, this coming January will be 20 years exactly. in operation. So, um, and the idea came after working in 99 on the Mallory expedition and the team of Sherpa that I was working with were from the village of Fort Say and then came back in 2002, Jenny and I were doing a 50th anniversary track for Everest and we were there and with um, Panuru and Funuru and, and um, Paul Den, a few of the other people that I'd worked with, there was this, and Jenny and I, along with our Nepali friends yeah. were, Let's find a way that we can learn how to climb that's community-based, that's, that you appreciate it and you do it because it's your, it's your passion. It's your avocation. But it is a vocation. It's for many of the people that work in the mountains, it's a vocation. So if you look at it like I, I'm going to climb because I love to climb and it's fun and, it, and it, it's part of my goal in life, you'll be a safer climber rather than it's just a job. So in that – that was sort of the foundation with it. And so working with um, Nepali climbers, there's over 1,700 students have graduated, and they go on to do great things. And, um, you know, Dao Yungsum is a great example. Yeah. If she finishes up Chiyu and Shishapangma, she'll have all 14 peaks and the first Nepali woman, and it's going to be great. And she's going to uplift and empower people in the process of that. So there's, um, there's always a good connection to those. I just want to touch base on this and add on that I would I definitely personally want to go ahead and thank Dava Futi as well as Dava Yanzum for making sure that <laughs> yeah. I got an opportunity to sit with you. So I definitely want to go ahead and thank Yeah, we had a lot of fun. Well. And Dava Futi with the Pasang Lumu Foundation. Yeah. yeah, two women that are doing good. And they they help out women across Southeast Asia. The, yeah. the, the Nepali women are strong and they uplift women from other countries. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, in the near future, I'm definitely going to go ahead and send you a picture from KCC as well. And oh, yeah. I'm hanging out here. <laughs> yeah. Well, hopefully we'll be back here in January of yeah. this year and um, looking forward to that. So, Thank you very much for your time. And this is the first time that I got to pick your brain a little bit. But this is, I hope this is not the last time I'll, I'll, I'll get yeah. to pick your brain some more. Down well, Sanjay, the thank the you so much. And for all the viewers around the world and... Deri Ramro. <laughs> Very good. I need to look big better at Nepali, but it um yeah, the yeah, it's a I'm always humbled to be a guest in this wonderful country of yours and the friendship and the kindness of the people here is, is something that the world needs more of. <laughs> so uh so this is this is this, this is not just a temporary home, this is your home. <laughs> yeah, the home where, <laughs> yeah, home is where the heart is, and so, but they're, yeah, they're, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're citizens of this wonderful planet, and the less we see yeah. geopolitical boundaries, and we see each other as humans, and that by helping out other humans, we help, we uplift ourselves. Yeah, because if you're angry, you're holding that anger, and that anger is burning your hands and it's burning your heart, and when you can go out and be like, hey, can I help you? Or the very simple thing, or can I do this or that, or um, yeah. So, it, and it requires when there's conflict for me, I have to like take a breath and say yeah. I'm not going to re re respond to it with conflict because that's just going to make me not feel good. So, and you can't quite ignore it because then it just sits with you for too long. But yeah, there. 
<laughs> well, thanks everyone for listening. Sanjay, thank you so much for the invitation. No, thank you very much. And uh, obviously I'm asking this already. I'm definitely going to try to go ahead and take more of your time in the future. And I hope you agree to this. <laughs> oh yeah, we're here and we've got our, uh, we have our contact and thanks to your team here that, uh, at the beautiful studio and I love this here. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you very much for everything that you've done for us, and uh, thank you very much for uh, no, right, uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me this time and uh, the amount of positivity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Woo! Thanks. This program is brought to you by. Via Studios.